Ladies, gentlemen, am I often forgotten, but certainly not by me. Subjugation Wards, welcome to the channel and welcome to another guide. In this guide, we're going to be looking at a budget setup for ED1. Now, being that this is a budget setup, this is not going to be, you know, the most expensive gear by any means. It's actually a pretty cheap setup. I think the total cost is around 1.2 bill for including everything. Weapons, armor, jewelry, rune pouches... Uh, any ability codexes. So for an all said and done package to go out and do some ED1, that sounds like a pretty good deal to me. So should you find yourself not quite able to afford the gear in this preset, there are a number of bosses you could go do to easily build up the GP for it. Uh, one of those being normal mode Carapac. Uh, it's a dead simple boss as long as you have a Pontifex Shadow Ring. And you could also use a boss like this to go ahead and learn uh, Sun Rotations, how to Fortic, other things like that that are going to be used in this guide. Now yes, I brought up the uh, mythical term for ticking. So since this guide is focused on a budget value and keeping the cost down, it sort of makes up for this lack of gear in use of techniques. Being that techniques are free to learn, they just take a little bit of time. Another boss you could do if you're short on gear is uh, normal mode or even hard mode Glacor. Both of those work rather well. And from what I've been told, a lot of more casual minded players will sit at Krosis and make a lot of GP from doing Krosis being that Crypt Bloom is is actually a pretty expensive armor set and since it's a skilling boss there's no pvm required however if you want to work on your skill sets a little bit more which are going to be very helpful inside of ed1 then i'd recommend going to either normal mode carapac or glacor uh, either normal or hard mode uh, i would personally recommend hard mode and streaking it's a really good way to improve your skill set overall or maybe even something like setting at god wars 2 and just practicing rotations that way you know anything of the sort is going to work however g conk is still about 120 mil for the drop and i believe the scripture of when is also still pretty expensive so both of those bosses are going to work out well for gp making anyways though i think that's enough rambling let's go ahead and get into this guide all right so taking a look at the gear used in this preset it is subjugation Cinder Banes with some Blast Diffusion Boots, and as far as weapons are concerned, it's just the Tier 85 Dual Wield and a Chaotic Staff. The perks on the weapons are the standard uh, entry level perks of Precise 6, Equal 4 on each of the weapons respectively, and obviously the Chaotic Staff just has both of them on 1. And the Subjugation has some good perks on it that are more of the endgame perks, however they're not too expensive to go for. The only expensive perk on this list is Biting 4, however you can downgrade it to Biting 3 and there's some pretty cheap combos to go for Biting 3, although it does take a while to get them. I believe it uses direct components or something like that. However, perks like Enhanced Devoted 4, uh, Crackling 4, Relent 5, that one's not too expensive, and Impatient 4, Mobile, that's the only one that can get a little bit pricey. However, you can you can just keep Mobile on your Bladed Dive swap, and then just remember to swap over to your Bladed Dive as you hit Surge. So that way you have the 10 second surge. Now as far as the rest of the inventory is concerned, it's just kind of a standard setup. The tier 88 offhand you see in the inventory, that is just a Karoming swap. It does not have to be a T88. It could be a Virtus book. It could be literally anything that you have lying around that's augmentable. Now I understand Greater Chain is a pretty expensive ability being it's anywhere from 500 to 650 mil, kind of depending on what day it is. However, like I said in the intro, there's other bosses you can do to make that GP up rather quickly and get you on the path to doing some ED1 solos. I put Reaver's Ring in this preset over Chandler's Ring because after looking at the prices, Reaver's Ring is only about 60 to 65 mil, where Chandler's is almost 100 plus there is a enchantment that you need to get for Chandler's to make it stronger. So honestly, I would just cheap out, go with Reaver's, and take the additional crit damage. Other items of note are the Yellow Power Burst. That is a power burst of acceleration. Allows you to zoom through other parts of the dungeon pretty quickly. And Dominion Mines are there for the crystals at Siru. Now as far as two cycling is concerned, you do not need mines per se for two cycling, however mines will make it significantly easier. Now I understand that there is a lot of quest requirements to get dominion mines and you have to do some dominion tower to get them, however the cost of getting these items are very low and as far as the utility of using them at Siru and a couple other places such as other dungeons or other bosses in general, uh, they are well worth the price tag of 
doing the quest. Trust me, I cannot stand doing quests either. I think they are the most obnoxious part of this game. However, I went ahead and even got Dominion Mines because of how useful they are. Other than that, the Crystal Daggers are just a bladed dive swap. Use whatever you have in that area. And the T90 Shield is just there as an example. If you have a cheaper shield, it'll work just fine. I honestly don't use the shield too much in this dungeon. It's kind of just a backup as a oh snap type thing where you start getting your world rocked by a random trash mob or something gets a little bit out of hand you know you can just pop on a shield real quick maybe snag a res or reflect or something like that but honestly i almost never use the shield in this run so just bring whatever you have other than that the food usage is blue blubbers and guthics rest i do this more so as an example or a proof of concept of you do not need as much food as you think you do um a lot of people go very overboard when it comes to food usage when honestly it's a little bit overkill especially when you're using solid foods i know a lot of people really enjoy bringing uh sailfish or rock tails or sharks in some cases and the problem with these is when you start to eat food and start to heal back up you're losing adrenaline i mean two eats is 20 percent adrenaline and that's quite a bit so using things like blubbers in combination with either a ceridomin brew or a guthix rest or anything along those lines is going to help you out a lot more because you're able to continue with your dps rotations and building your hp up that way through means like soul split flicking and the whole concept of killing the boss before it kills you comes into play um, it makes life a lot easier to just go ahead and use blubbers with some sort of potion now there are use cases in this game where selfish soup are used uh, mostly at telos or at some very high in rage very difficult bosses uh, like zamorak when he's like above 1k plus or something like that there are some niche use cases for solid food however a majority of the time you just simply do not need the healing capacity that these foods bring as far as the rune pouches are concerned this is the standard setup that pvme offers uh, discord.gg forward slash pvme for those who are wondering now as far as relics are concerned they are my bog standard relics now i do understand that um not many people are going to have 120 archaeology at this gear level so using something like coe fury of the small death ward that is something there however archaeology it is a low cost skill and you're gonna have to get it anyway so i would recommend getting that out of the way first and really working on skills and whatnot however if you're lower on relic power you could simply drop death ward as honestly if you're doing the dungeon in a efficient manner you're not going to be taking too much damage anyways uh, kind of fun fact the example runs i did i was testing this preset last night and i forgot that i didn't have death ward on i had a blessing of het i think or i think i even had like some div relic on there or something like that and so when i was going through the dungeon there was like a couple moments that were kind of spicy but other than that not it was nothing that was unmanageable by any means so you could drop out death ward should you please but fury of the small and conservation of energy uh, those are very useful however as far as non-fsoa magic damage is concerned you could probably drop conservation of energy and swap it out for something else the main one is getting one percent on each basic that i find the most useful and and there are ways to see sneak tsunami into a rotation without coe to where it's not too much of an issue so as far as that's concerned just use the best relics that you have access to and the final note yes that is a hybrid cape from hard mode zuck you do not need the hybrid cape you just need the standard magic one from normal mode and it will work just fine it's just to make omni power work rather well anyways no i think that's enough rambling let's go ahead and get into the example run one final quick note, the EOF does have a G staff in it, that's all that's in there, and the Luck of the Dwarves ring is just for not getting cheese and tomato bottas throughout the dungeon run. Alrighty, here we are for the example run. Now before we get started in this, I just want to talk about a couple things. The sticks I am using are Quarm, Lantadime, and Spirit Weed and I will be using a Ripper Demon. Now as far as usage on Powder of Penance is concerned, if you're using Ripper Demon and you have enough spirituals, these are not necessary at all because you'll be paying attention to your Ripper spec bar and letting it just kind of autopilot and you'll be filling this up much more than you'll ever be concerned about filling up prayer so just keep that in mind now should you find yourself taking a bit too much damage for your comfort levels you could use something like a hellhound and bring restorers and then maybe powder of penance could be used although these are kind of expensive to be fair 
you know, mill an hour cost for just prayer restore when, you know, super restores or extreme prayers are really cheap in comparison, you know, it's up to you, but uh, you can go ahead and make that call. However, as far as the example run is concerned, I will be using Ripper Demon and Spiritual Prayers. Alrighty, that's enough rambling though, let's go ahead and get into this example run. And just full send it. Alright, so what I like to do is equip my bladed dive and then surge down this hallway. I like to click on this little line here in the middle of the stairs. And then once I get there, I like to surge bladed dive over to this tile here, equip my Karoming Swamp, Karoming, and just do an Omni Power. And then just use basic abilities to kill off anything that's left. Now, here what I like to do is surge bladed dive, surge again and barge into this guy. Now here, I will put on my melee prayer. I kind of messed this up, but it'll work just fine anyways. Charge up a detonate and release with a D-breath. And just kill off anything that's left. Couple bleeds, so I'll go ahead and hit freedom. Here I like to run in the center of this hallway, get the aggro, surge back, so they go into a nice little uh, AOE spot. Need a little bit of food because we are getting a little bit of damage, but nothing unmanageable. And we're off to the races. Now here, I like to anticipate, target this guy and hit G-Chain while out of distance. Then release an Omni Power into a Corrupt Blast that'll spread off to these guys. And just use a Dragon Breath with a couple auto attacks, maybe a G-Conk to kill off the other three. And something that's worth noting is uh, Ice Rack is very powerful here. At the end of the dungeon, I'll show you how I have that set up. I'll show how I have that set up. Can't quite do it here, but Ice Racking is very important where you're just auto casting Ice Barrage into Rack, which on pretty much all targets that are stunnable or bindable, it'll turn Rack into the same strength as a uh, as Dragon Breath. It's a 188% instead of the usual 94. So here. Just put on our bladed dive, bladed dive surge, use our excel pot to kind of just zoom through here. I like to go over to this side. Here I'll hit devotion, target the center one, use a corrupt blast, auto debreath. Just use a couple of abilities here to try and get my devotion extended. We did not, but it's not the end of the world. Now for this boss, if you're not comfortable with this upcoming method, you can simply teleport out and teleport back in. But what I like to do is run in a little bit and then surge bladed dive to this tile here. And what that'll do is trap all of the R hats behind this uh, raised part of the ground here. And then you're free to just stand here and do the boss normally. So what that looks like is we'll toss a Vuln Bomb with a Sunshine. Do a G-Conk, second ability, third ability. I like to auto Tsunami into a G-Conk. On Exsanguinate, Wild Magic is Fix. Do a full four hit face fix. And then G-Conk into an Omni Power. I'll go ahead and disrupt this hit. Auto Sonic into a Charge Detonate. Oh, gotta press the ability. Release with any old basic G-Conk into a wild magic, and then do an fix. Now this thing, uh, this little smoke cloud attack, I just like to surge just after he starts his little melee spout there, and just plant it at, at melee distance. Now we have a little bit of time here. Uh, for this part of the spout, I just like to res. And we're just waiting for G-Conk. Go ahead and spam the Ripper a little bit more. And here we are, now we can do a second sunshine. Now what's nice is we can go to the front of our sunshine here to plant this smoke. And then we have our tile here to play with. And then this one we can just tank and soul split. It's only a 6k as long as you're high HP you should be fine. And you can soul split the rest back. And do an Omni, maybe a D-Breath, maybe another G-Conk and it's dead. Two sunshines with this gear should be more than enough to take care of Sanctum and not worry about the third smoke. However, you can run over by the door if you're a little bit behind on damage. Now for this room, I like to surge blade to dive here, and usually I surge across, but I forgot to do that this time. 
Use Corrupt Blast here with a couple D breaths and some auto attacks. Here I like to turn on Range Prayer, Surge, Bladed Dive Surge, and hit Devotion. And then Corrupt Blast, charge a detonate, and then release that detonate with a Dragon Breath. And then once these three mages are dead, you can Surge Bladed Dive down. And here I like to use my Acceleration Potion. Do it twice here, Surge Bladed Dive, Surge Bladed Dive. Eat a little bit more food. And just surge along. That guy you just use like a wild magic. That's about it. I like to bladed dive across here to one of these two tiles. Then here, I'm just gonna use a dragon breath. And ice rack accordingly. Just using basics and keeping high adren, because what I like to do up here. Surge bladed dive to this tile, corrupt this guy and then charge a detonate on the center one in the line of five and release that with a tsunami. Dragon Breath the last guy, and then they should all be dead. This one needs a little bit of extra assistance before we go in the door. Overload seems to be running out, so I'll go ahead and do that. I like to anticipate here. G chain into a wild magic. And then just use some basic abilities, maybe another threshold or a G conk to uh, finish them off. And then I like to do a surge, and then ice auto these guys so they're frozen in place. And use something like maybe auto D breath, and then if one's still alive, just hit him with a G conk and you should die. And then what I like to do here is surge bladed dive to this tile, and then what I'll do is G chain into an omni, charge a detonate, release that with dragon breath, maybe target another one to get the corrupt blast off. But uh, the really nice thing here is Scripture of When. As you can see, it procs, does a lot of damage, and those melees are no more. And then here, just kill off these four to open up the gate, the little zealots. Sometimes one of the healers will come by and heal them, sometimes they don't. And what I'd like to do here... Now, if you want to be very speedy, you can just surge down quickly bank here and get off to the races that way and start the boss. But if you want to teleport here, there's nothing wrong with that. So I'll go ahead and equip my bladed dive, surge bladed dive, and then target cycle with a smoke cloud to start my sun. G conk, basic, third basic, into a wild, or a tsunami wild, and then stall my devotion as long as possible so that way it lasts the rest of the attack. Heal up just a little bit. And we'll just go ahead and do Auto Omni. Kind of following just normal DPS principles of getting off, you know, two Wild Magic, two Asphyxes, an Omni Power, and maybe a Detonate. You can also G-Staff if you want. That's a very strong ability. Auto G-Staff, or Auto G-Conk into a G-Staff definitely works. And we'll just Threshold here until 275. Now to make phase 3 a little bit easier, which is coming up, this is phase 2, I like to bladed dive each of these and then just kill them so that way you always have bladed dive to get to the different uh, thrashing waters. And it also puts you melee distance so you're, uh, the effect here, calm, calm waters, that will certainly help you out and make damage on phase 3 a lot less, uh, you'll get a lot less damage on P3, it's a damage reduction effect. <laughs> Being a little bit lost for words there, but we'll just run through pretty usual. And then what you can do towards the latter half of this phase is get a devotion and then kill some of the thrashing waters to get some devotion extensions and you should be fine. I think we're almost getting to the two minute mark. I think I phased it around 50 seconds, so about 220 is, 220 to 230 is when I would expect to see him start phase three. But we can go ahead and devotion now. An extension. And I guess the biggest piece of advice I can have for this is just uh, stay calm, try not to panic, and you know, 
the best way to build up uh, calmness at a boss is just doing it repeatedly. If you've died enough and you know what's happening, then you're fine. And you won't be as panicked anymore. You can go for a res if you like, but I'm going to go ahead and toss a Vuln Bomb down and then start a Sunshine. I always like to start my Sunshine with a Smoke Cloud. Back up a little bit. I'm just going to go for an Auto Tsunami here to a Wild Magic and just Soul Split Flick accordingly. You miss a couple flicks, there's nothing wrong with that. You can even pop Disrupt Shield to negate one of the hits. When he jumps in the air like that, the hit will be a little bit more delayed, but that is the magic attack. And we'll go ahead and drink up a couple of spirituals. <clears throat> if you want a guaranteed uh, working ripper, this boss is very clunky when it comes to familiar usage. So what you can do is actually stand over here in these stairs, and this will guarantee that your familiar is out and working. And we'll go ahead and finish this off. Make sure you're high adrenaline for this next part. That is important to finish off Masuda at high adrenaline. So that way what you can do here is turn on your magic prayer and then surge bullet a dive over. Try and last as long as you can. We got an enhanced devoted proc there and then proc devoted uh, here. So then you can get an extended devoted on these. Uh, defense pylons and then make sure you get your extensions. G conch should be more than enough to finish them off. A little auto sonic into a g-conk here and then you shouldn't need food for this fight but if you want to you can teleport out there and then come back in and bank to get more food <clears throat> however it is not necessary what i do for this boss is just like anything else we're going to start off with a sunshine rotation toss down our volden bomb place my son in a little bit awkward spot but you know what? it's fine i'm going to save my a pot though and that's so to make the crystals a little bit easier. Now, this is going to be a two-cycle rotation. Uh, th th this gear is not going to one-cycle, unfortunately. As much as I would love it to one-cycle, uh, maybe some mad lad out there could figure it out, but uh, that is certainly not me, and it's not... It wouldn't be consistent. Now, here, since it spawned close, you can stand on that to uh, make it not spew hands everywhere, but just be warned, because after a while, some hands will pop up, so you don't want to stay on that tile for too long. And as far as this dr wiping Dragon Breath is concerned that he does, as long as uh, you see this line here in the tile decoration, as long as you're south of that line, you do not get hit by the Dragon Breath animation. Now we're almost ready to go. What about 213, 206, and 198. There we go, so now we can go up. At 7.2, that is when he is essentially knocked out. Now here, we're just going to threshold this one down. Surge, place our mines, and then just do some thresholds. I'm going to try and get an Omni off as quick as possible. And then just do something like Wild Magic Asphyx. Maybe a nice rack in between. And we have plenty of time to get this crystal down. As you can see, we're at 40k left of the uh, little uber healing blobs have not even spawned yet. So you have all the time in the world to then start a setup here. Now you could do a natty build, you could do something else, you can get a sunshine built up if you'd like. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to sun with an A-pot. Oh, we got a relent proc, so it didn't matter. Make sure a Vuln Bomb is placed. Make sure it's smoke clouded. You get a couple bleeds off and then G-conk. Charge up a Detto. Wait for the next set of Ubers. There should be five and six here. Release with an Omni Power into a D Breath. Place the mines down. G Conk. And then just do as much damage as you possibly can. Read them out of this and G Chain these guys and then just use any ability here. It's just so they don't go up and heal again, because if you let one of these slip by, they will go up and do an uber. If you really want to, you can go ahead and res that hit. And we're just waiting for our sunshine to come back uh, off cooldown. I did not mean to press Omni Power there, but you know what? Stuff happens.
And this hit should only hit you for about 3k if you have Protection Prayer on, and you can Soul Split for Flick the rest of your HP back. Now for these attacks, uh, something to keep in mind is you can stand one tile to the north and to the east, but you cannot stand to the west or the south or it will hit you. We got a slightly unlucky with this hand pattern. I'll just go for a res just for funsies. Don't need it, but you know, might as well be full HP. Toss another Omni Power down. Auto Sonic, maybe into a G Conk Wild Magic. And we're starting to get to 7.2 again. I'm just keeping an eye on my Sunshine. I would like it to be up for the start of this next crystal. Should just do a prep just for fun. And we're ready to go. We're going to climb up the opposite side this time. Use Volm Bomb, right click on the crystal, and then surge with an ability. And then just go ahead and start our sunshine, because now we can just kill off the crystals and just kind of go ham. Wild Magic into an Asphyx. Actually, I think I did Wild Magic G-Conk there. Go for an Ice Rack. Deconk into a D-Breath. And then this last one is low HP, so we can just Omni, G-Conk, and it's dead. Make sure to put on your Luck of the Dwarves, just so you can see how many scales you get. And maybe for a little bit better chance at some loot. But that is all there really is to it, as far as an ED1 run is concerned with uh, budget year. It can be done. It can be done pretty efficiently for how cheap this gear is in, you know, comparison to other more expensive gear out there. And overall, if you're looking to get into ED1, then, you know, the barrier for entry is a lot lower than most people would expect. Now, as far as the magic setup I am doing, or the spell setup that I am using, I go over a lot of these things. Um, I go over four ticking, and I go over a couple other things, like auto spell slot. I believe I go over all of this in my magic DPS guide. I'll go ahead and put that in the card in the upper right. But a quick rundown uh, as far as my spell selection is concerned. So right here, uh, above my ability bars, I have my spell book open. And I'm usually switching between Insight, Fear, and Exsanguinate. Now how this works is... We go to settings, uh, I believe it is action bar. You can see here I have manual spell casting on. Now what this allows is for you to have an auto cast set, but you can foretick in other spells and not swap over to that spell for an auto cast. So it gives you a lot of freedom when it comes to trying to freeze off minions but you don't want your auto spell to become ice barrage and then freeze other minions or you know you start losing insight fear or exsanguinate stacks it allows you a lot of versatility when using magic now i understand that four tick is a high barrier for some people but if you just put in the work at combat dummies within a few days or for some people even just a couple hours you'll have the concept down and be able to apply it just about anywhere and if you go ahead and you know stick through it and learn four ticking and get used to it you'll put yourself at quite the advantage because understanding how four tick works means you you have a deeper understanding of the combat system in general of this game and that gives you a big advantage when learning higher end techniques and rotations and whatnot that involve things like ability stalling and other things of the sort and is very helpful later on so it's definitely worthwhile to learn some of the techniques now rather than trying to push it off later and have the gear try and carry you. But as you can see, with explaining everything and stopping throughout the dungeon run, I believe the aura timer was on 42 minutes when ending, so anywhere from 3 to 3.5 runs per hour. Uh, if you're very efficient with your rotations, um, you can upgrade a few points of these this gear and easily get into 4 runs an hour territory. And honestly, with this dungeon being consistent GP with the scales, you're always getting ancient scales. The GP per hour is pretty consistent, plus you have a chance at some big 
big boy scale drops that can bring in a lot of GP. So this is a very cost effective way to go ahead and make some GP for some upgrades. Anyways, though, I hope this guide was helpful. I hope this explanation was helpful on some of the things I'm doing. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them down in the comments below. I am almost always replying to comments. I almost always have YouTube open as far as my playlists are concerned for music. And I usually get notified pretty quickly of a comment posted. So feel free to post on down there. I should be able to reply within a 12 to 24 hour period. And with all that being said, let's go ahead and roll that outro. Ladies and gentlemen, and I did not forget about you subjugation awards. Thank you very much for watching. Your viewership is greatly appreciated. Have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon, nighttime, whatever it is, wherever you are. And I will see you next time for the next video. Peace.